My name is Dr. Raul McLaughlin. I have degrees in archaeology and ancient history from Queen's University, Belfast. My subject is the Roman economy, including trade beyond the imperial frontiers. I have published several books on this subject. The question is, why were the ancient Romans in Georgia? You can read about this subject in my book, The Roman Empire and the Silk Roots. This is part three of a lecture on Greek and Roman voyages in the Black Sea. I delivered this talk to the Classical Association of Northern Ireland at Queen's University Belfast in November 2018. I gave an earlier version of this lecture to the Classical Association of Ireland in Cork University in summer 2017. The lecture was prompted by the recent discovery of intact ancient shipwrecks in the Black Sea. Ancient Colchis was a heavily forested frontier territory on the east coast of the Black Sea. It was positioned in the Caucasus, a mountain range which forms a major barrier between Roman Anatolia and a grassland wilderness known as the Pontic Caspian Steppe. The Colchis was renowned for its shipbuilding resources, including large quantities of timber brought down on its rivers, sailcloth linen made by local peoples, supplies of hemp for rigging rope, and wax and pitch for waterproofing hulls. The Roman economy was dependent on seafaring, so these resources were important in maintaining maritime connections across the empire. The region had been brought under Roman authority by the eastern campaigns of Pompeii in the first century BC. In the second century AD, the Roman governor Arian wrote a report for the Emperor Hadrian describing a voyage from Anatolia to the Colchis. From Apsaros, Arian sailed with a Roman squadron north to the port of Phasis on the east coast of the Black Sea. Arian describes the strange properties of the Phasis River, the Rion, which flowed down through the Caucasus Mountains. The Phasis was the largest river in the region and it discharged a vast quantity of unusual water into the Black Sea. This water was fresher and lighter than the contents of other rivers and had the appearance of being tainted by tin or lead. The outflow from the Phasis River did not mix easily with the surrounding seawater and was seen floating above the marine currents. Arian observed how local people could take their cattle down to the shore to drink because the river had greatly diluted the salinity of the adjacent sea. These odd properties encouraged a superstition among sailors who would pour away all stored water when they reached the river and took on board fresh phasis water. Arian reports that it is said that those who do this will encounter favourable sailing conditions. To the Greeks, Colchis was a forbidding region, shut in by rocks and rivers that run through ravines. Strabo describes Phasis as the furthest most voyage, and reports that the great fame of this country in early times is revealed by the myths which refer in an obscure way to the expedition of Jason. Apollonius Rhodius imagined how the Argonauts stowed their sails and manned the oars to enter the broad flowing Phasis in search of the shady grove of Ares where the glaring serpent, a monster terrible to behold, watches over a golden fleece spread over an oak tree. Appian had a theory concerning the golden fleece of Greek legend, and he describes how many streams issuing from the Caucasus carry fine gold dust that is almost invisible. The mountain people placed sheepskins with shaggy fleeces into the stream to collect the floating particles. Appian suggests that these fleeces might have been the prize sought by Jason. The Phasis River is mentioned by ancient poets and orators as one of the prime ports on the Roman frontiers alongside the Euphrates, Ethiopia and Britain. Within the Caucasus, there were five native rulers who sought recognition from Rome as regional kings. Their authority either extended 
over tribal settlements in the mountains, or covered rural populations near the coast. Some of these rulers had received imperial confirmation and grants of power from the Roman Emperor Trajan, and Hadrian had approved at least four of these rulers as kings. The cooperation of these kings and their native communities was crucial to maintaining the security of coastal Greek cities. Near the gates of Phasus port, there was a large statue of the patron goddess Visene that personified the town. She was depicted holding a symbol and seated on a throne with lions at her feet. Arian thought that the statue resembled Rhea, the earth mother of the Greek pantheon. The main anchor from Jason's ship the Argo was on display in the town centre as a monument to the ancient myth. Arian wrote with frankness about this object and explained that it is made of iron and although it does not look old to me, the shape is unusual and it is not the same size as modern anchors. There were also some old fragments of a stone anchor on display and Arian believed that these objects were more likely to be the remnants of the anchor that Jason had aboard the Argo. Apollonius Rhodius confirms this tradition that the Argo carried stone anchors. Strabo calls Phasis the Emporium, commercial centre of Colchis, and explains that the site had good natural defences. Protected on one side by the river, on another by a lake, and on the third by the sea. The town had a Roman fort garrisoned by a small and well-equipped force of 400 select troops. Arian describes how the fort had a double-ditched perimeter and its original inner wall was made from banks of earth and a wooden palisade guarded by two flanking towers. The site was being upgraded by replacing the wooden defences with walls and towers made from brick blocks. Arian concluded, the new fortress is fully equipped to prevent any of the barbarians from approaching and will certainly protect the garrison from sieges. Arian had also given thought to the protection of the surrounding community, which included many merchants and ex-soldiers. He reports, The mooring place for the ships and the whole area outside the fort must also be secured because it is settled by veterans and various merchants. In assessing the situation, Arian ordered the perimeter of the town to be fortified by a double-ditch stockade that extended from the fort to the river and fully enclosed the harbour and surrounding houses. He concluded that the town would soon be highly secure and become a very convenient and safe place for those who sail this route. Roman merchants operating at Phasis received Indian cottons, pearls, and black pepper, which had been transported through mountain passes. These mountain passes connected through the Caspian to the Central Asian silk routes. North of Phasis, the Colchis seaboard curved west towards the Crimea and the upper reaches of the Black Sea. Arian explains that the squadron were no longer sailing in the direction of the setting sun, as they followed a coastline overshadowed by the greater Caucasus. On this sailing, the summit of an enormous landmark named Strobios came into view amongst the distant mountain range, Mount Elbrus. The snow-covered peak of this formidable summit was pointed out as the place where, according to legend, Prometheus was strung up on the orders of Zeus. Apollonius Rhodius imagined what the crew of the Argo might have seen as they sailed, past the steep rising crags of the Caucasian mountains, where Prometheus had his limbs bound to hard rocks with bronze shackles. They might have heard a loud sound near the clouds as their sails shook with the beat of huge wings, and seen long eagle feathers like polished oars as they witnessed the screams of Prometheus as his liver was torn away. From Phasis, it was a voyage of 63 miles along this coast to the site of a fortified Hellenic city named Sebastopolis, Sukumi. Sebastopolis 
used to be known by the name Dioscurius, and the city had been founded by Milesian Greeks in the 6th century BC. Strabo characterized Sebastopolis as a cultic city and the common emporium of the surrounding tribes, the meeting place for 70 populations. By the Augustan era, there was a large steppe presence near Sebastopolis, including many Sarmatians. Pliny had heard that during the late Republic, Roman traders carried out business in the city with a staff of 130 interpreters. However, he reports that in his own time the city had declined dramatically, and much of the merchant community had abandoned the site for more profitable ports and markets on the Black Sea coast. Parts of the city might have been abandoned, but the fortress remained intact and well guarded. It was almost midday when Arian sailed into the port of Sepastopolis. The remains of stone towers and walls that have been found on the seabed near Sukumai are probably Roman defences submerged by coastal erosion, seismic activity, or dramatic changes to the sea level along this shore. Arian calculated that it was about 226 miles from the fleet base at Trapezus to the city of Sebastopolis. This was not a great distance for Greek and Roman cargo ships involved in coastal trade circuits, and the sailing could be completed in four days if conditions were favourable. After visiting Apsaros, Phasis and Sebastopolis, many trade vessels would have followed the Black Sea coast north to the Crimean Peninsula to conduct further commercial deals with ports adjoining the Scythian steppe. During the Roman era, the Crimean kingdom was subject to the empire, and its Hellenic kings were approved by the emperors. The kingdom sent annual tribute payments to Rome, accompanied by ambassadors who sailed on specially designated vessels. Lucian took passage aboard one of these returning ships, as it sailed from Rome past the west coast of Greece near Corinth. When Arian undertook his voyage around the Black Sea, he sailed only as far as Sebastopolis on the frontier of direct Roman rule, because this was the limit of his provincial command. However, he thought it worthwhile to include information for Hadrian on the voyage to Crimea. The client King Cotus II had just died, so there was a possibility that Hadrian might choose to depose the dynasty and place Chersonensis under direct provincial rule. Arian explains, I have decided that it is my duty to explain the sailing routes as far as the Chimeran Bosporus to you. So if you are planning something for the region, you will know about the voyage. Ancient Crimea was at the edge of the known world, on the furthest limits of Greco-Roman civilization. To learn more about this subject, please see part four of this lecture, The Roman Crimea. Subscribe to my channel and follow the link to my book, The Roman Empire and the Silk Roots. Thank you.